your old team, uh, Ferrari. How do you sort of view their performance this year? Well, I think, you know, the, the, I don't want to talk badly of Ferrari uh, because, you know, I have a great passion for them. Um, and, you know, I, I, I really like, like Fred as well. Um, but they've been a bit mediocre compared to what I thought they were going to do at the start of the season. I thought they were on a much um, stronger upward trajectory. So I would like to see Ferrari do well. I think what's really, um, let's say, uh, what, what, what's been really um, encouraging about Ferrari is that they, they, they operate much slicker now. If you go back a few years, um, and we can be really open and honest about this, they were pretty dreadful at the track, right? They made a lot of mistakes. They made a lot of like almost rookie mistakes, like small team mistakes. They just didn't get it right enough to be a top team or they didn't get it right as, as, as much as a top team should have been. They've, I think under Fred and the way that they've restructured themselves, they're, they're doing much, much better, right? They're, they're not making the rookie mistakes. But they seem to be a little bit up and down. And I think this is the um, probably the, the, the story of this season is that I think that with the compounds that, that we've got this season, um, constructions are, are, are very similar, as in like the, the makeup of the tyre, the, the way that the tyre is made. I think they might be a little bit difficult to use. We sometimes see that with the Red Bull, that they're difficult to use. We definitely, we've seen that with the Ferrari, that they've struggled to get on top of them in, in, in some races. You know, some races has been, have been absolutely awful. And then others, they kind of come back. You know, we've even seen them winning races this year. But, you know, I've, I've got a lot of confidence. Um, I don't know whether for this season, but certainly for when, when Lewis gets there, I think that he is going to be a catalyst for good things to happen there. Okay, well, that's interesting. I, I want to ask you on that because I, I'm thinking if Lewis is coming there without the relationship he's had with Bono, Peter Bonington, his engineer, you know how important it is, the, the race driver and engineer, you, you're part engineer and you're part psychologist. You know, you, you know when to give him a kick and you know when to give him a cuddle. And yeah. I just think Lewis walking into Ferrari on his own, he knows Fred, he doesn't really know that many other people. So uh, do you think it's just a respect thing? It's a bit like, you know, Michael walking into Mercedes um, where you, you suddenly go, wow, we, we, must be, we must be a really good team when a driver like that chooses us. When a driver like Lewis chooses your team, you know, when a seven times world champion chooses your team to come and work at your team, first of all, you know, there's a, I, I don't think he needs to bring like an entourage with him. Uh, and I always spoke about this, this publicly, both for, um, for, for, for Lewis himself, I think, uh, but also for, for, for people like Pete, for, for people like Bono, you know, um, I think that it's a, it, that's quite a dangerous game to play, you know, to kind of follow the driver around because if the driver falls out of favor or the driver decides that after one year, this is not for him. Um, you know, he can't take the entourage with him. So I, I think that Lewis has done the right thing. You know, he'd obviously have like Team LH around him, um, you know, like his management and, and trainers and people like that. But but I think trying to take engineers would have would have been a bit of a misstep. Um, so I think that the team will embrace him. I, you know, I, I think that if you go there with a bit of a reputation, like what Lewis has got um, for being able to deliver, the team will get around him. The team will definitely get around him. Then Lewis has got to do his part as well. Lewis has definitely got to play his part in endearing himself um, and embracing the culture of the team, you know, and not like being on the periphery of that. And if he can do that, they will love him. Honestly, he will walk on water. And I think the team will now feel just like you've just, you know, like you've just said, DC, the team will now feel they'll just be able to raise their game by another one, two percent because they'll feel that confidence, right? This is a seven times world champion coming into your team, having chosen your team over a, effectively a team he's been at for, let's call it all of his life. If you take the engine part of it, um, suddenly he's walking away from all of that and all of that legacy and he's, and, he, and he's choosing you guys. So that gives you a massive boost of confidence. Um, and if everybody works that half 1% uh, harder um, or smarter, then, you know, great things can happen.
There is no doubt that the Italian framework and the mentality and how they operate is different. So there's a bit of a learning curve there for Lewis. And please also remember something that in, in Leclerc, in Charles, they have a little treasure, they think. They absolutely adore him. Uh, there's no one like him um, in many respects. And he has a particularly nice person. So for Lewis to go in there um, and assume that he's going to just walk all over uh, Charles Leclerc, um, I don't think Lewis is thinking like that and he shouldn't think like that. It's going to be a tough call and it's one of the great intriguing battles that I'm looking forward to next year is how those two square up to each other. I, I don't think that Lewis will go in there with that attitude. I think that Lewis is, uh, is, is a true professional. I think he knows how good Charles is. Um, but he will also back himself to beat him over over sure. twenty four races or whatever it, it it is. So I think they probably will. And you think have he will? A decent dynamic. Yeah, I think he will. I think he will. I think there'll come a point when he won't be able to do that anymore. But it's certainly not now. I mean, the guy's so fit. He's so mentally strong. I think when he's motivated, what what we've seen, I think with Lewis over these last couple of years is you know. I don't want to call it a lack of motivation because that's well, that would be disrespectful to the guy. But I think we've seen every now and again like some frustration that comes through in him not being able to then deliver at ten tenths, like he has done in the past. But I but but there's there's there is no doubt about the amount of passion that this guy has and how much he wants to win. I mean, if you look at his reaction after um, the British Grand Prix this year, that tells you everything you need to know, right? This is a guy that hasn't won for, I can't even remember how long it was because these type of facts don't interest me that much, but is it two years, three years, something like yeah. that? And then he comes back and he wins, you know, and all of us who were lucky to be there and watch it live, it was just like a masterclass in, in, in Lewis Hamilton, seven times world champion, how to win a race. Um, you know, super impressive, super impressive drive. Um, but you saw the passion at the end. You know, you saw the emotion at the end. This guy wants to win. But I think he's, you know, there's there's a certain, I think with with anybody who's done really well in life, there's there's also a certain amount of humility, you know, when, when you're constantly looking inward and thinking, what do I need to do better? So I don't think Lewis is going to go to Ferrari and... Um, and think that he's going to be able to trounce Charles because I don't think first of all he won't be able to because um, it just won't be that easy because because Charles is a great peddler as you say Eddie, um, but you know um, second I think he's he's just he I I believe he will work very hard I think he'll work very hard I think he'll integrate himself into the team and I think that will be the making of the next stage of Ferrari. Um, Rob, one of the things that. Uh, I do want to talk about is where you are right now. And you have uh, become a bit of an entrepreneur. And, uh, you know, as you stepped away from the front line of being involved in Formula One, and you've also started to get uh, pretty involved in at the grassroots level in karting. And you're part of what's called the Global Karting League. Now, it'd be really good, I think, for any of our uh, families out there, the younger listeners, just to understand exactly what that is, what motivated you to start it, and, and how do the the, the young talents get involved in that because there's no question that whatever you're doing at grassroots has a as a sort of growth vision towards preparing people for Formula One, whether it be as a driver or an engineer or designer, whatever it happens to be. I wanted to get you know when I when I stopped being at the coalface as as you describe it, um, I I wanted to do something um, you know with the businesses that I was building that 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 gave back in some way or, or at least tried to make a change and, and one of the the things you know we we both know this because we're both sons of late teenage boys now and in fact um what the listeners won't know is that um you and i dc used to well still do meet our, uh, each other at, at kart tracks where our kids go karting yeah um and and so i got into that like kind of when i i when i can't remember i mean Dayton and Frankie, I think are about the same age, aren't they? They're about 16, 15, 16. And, and what, uh, so I got into karting and I thought, this is really good and it's really good. I, I've got no like um, ambitions for, for, for my son Frankie to be a, a, a driver, but I just thought this is a great way for him to learn about life um, and about winning, losing and all the rest of it. 
the problem is, um, unless you've got a few quid in the bank, um, it's not open to everybody, right? Um, so I started to, this really got me thinking and thinking, well, how do you make a difference? You know, why should we all be so complicit with the fact that it costs 100K a year or something to go karting? And if it is costing 100K a year, um, either as an industry, um, we are very, very lucky because all of our talent comes from this tiny gene pool of, of, of privileged kids or there's Occam's razor, which tells you that there's lots of talent um, elsewhere in the world, but there's not the opportunity. So I wanted to start something where the kids got the same kind of, uh, you know, exactly the same experience on track, build a credible pathway, like all the way through from coming in at five, six years old and, and popping out at 15. And then, you know, kind of pull that all together in like a, in, in a league system and also give the best drivers a chance to get into cars as well so lots of so we've been doing it for a couple of years now in the uk it's been growing um and now i am expanding next year so we're going to expand it um we're going to go into different markets we're going to go into the us um so we've got like an international and a global feel about it after that um in 2026 we will be expanding europe middle east want to get into non-traditional markets as well so it does become truly global india africa um china places like that and i want to start to find talent i want kids to start to like really experience this but i want to also start to find talent from non-traditional backgrounds um so it's really cool you know um we've got a there's some really exciting announcements coming in the next um few months about what this is going to look like about some really mega prizes about if you're good enough and you win um there's a car waiting for you all of that type of stuff i think it's absolutely brilliant and uh, as someone that's that's spending uh, money on exactly the same sort of vision of wanting to help uh, dayton who wants to race i, I think it's a, it's a wonderful way of learning the highs and lows you know the smile on their face when they do do well and the that, you know, the tears in their eyes when it doesn't go well, this is a reflection of life. And I think that's where sports, totally. whether it's racing, carts, teaches you so much about once you go out into the big bad world where not everyone's going to say yes, son, or yes, daughter. And to that end as well, actually, I just wanted to, to mention the fact that you're involved, like me, with uh, advising uh, More Than Equal, which is the uh, Research Foundation ultimately to help with it, that, the very high uh, aspiration of finding the first female world champion, Formula One world champion, um, and using science. And that's what I'd like to ask you uh, more about actually as well, given that you've got this engineering mind and the science-based approach and um, you know going out into the non-traditional markets. Why is it that sometimes in karting, we have like brilliant European racers and you, names that sound like Formula One world champions, but yet they go to cars and they just, don't really hit it. You know, I would say the home of karting traditionally has been Italy. The home of Formula One has been Britain. You know, not being disrespectful to Ferrari and I'm not being disrespectful to, to British karting, but just in terms of, you know, the, the karting industry really has grown out of, of Italy. Yeah, we haven't had an Italian world champion uh, for, for a long time. I very simplistically, not using signs, go, well, it's like, just because you're a squash world champion doesn't mean you're going to beat Nadal or Djokovic in tennis. And you might think, well, it's a racket, it's a ball. Why not? If you can hit a ball, why would you not be able to be a, a multiple discipline champion in racket sports? Well, do you understand what I'm trying to get at without using the signs? Karting is maybe squash, which is incredibly difficult. And tennis is the one that's more globally popular, and that's cars. So there was a question in there somewhere. I just can't remember what it was. I, I'll, I'll, I'll work it out, DC. Um, I'll work out the question. <laughs> Can um, I ask so... DC a question? He talked about <laughs> who was the last Italian world champion, DC? <clears throat> and when? Uh, I, I think it was like Nuvolari in this 50s. Ascari, 1953. Okay, move on. Now it's your turn, Rob. Let's hear. You see, was there. you see what I'm having to deal with? A nincompoop. <laughs> <laughs> Eddie, Eddie was his boss. <laughs> yeah, yeah, his manager. <laughs> no, I was his, I was his financial advisor. 